Last time, we introduced the predator-prey equations, which we set up as modeling foxes eating rabbits in a closed ecosystem where they only change due to births, deaths, and the interactions they have with each other. I've put the equations that we looked at last time at the bottom of this slide, and where we left off, we were wondering if there were any changes that we could make, perhaps to make the assumptions that we're placing on these two populations more realistic. Here's the change I suggest at this point. Instead of assuming that the rabbits would grow exponentially in the absence of foxes, let's enforce a carrying capacity on the rabbit population. That means instead of having exponential growth for our rabbits, we'll have a logistic function. So in the absence of foxes, what would the equation for drdt look like? We'll keep using the same parameter A out front. And so to set this up as a population that has a carrying capacity, we can do A times R times the quantity one minus R divided by K, where that's the carrying capacity. Now let's couple this back with the fox population. We're not going to make any changes to the fox population in this lecture, but you're welcome to think of what you might change about that model too. So were there any assumptions that we made about foxes that you would alter? We'll have drdt equals a times r times the quantity one minus r over k minus b times rf, where that's the interaction with the foxes that we had before. And then the fox equation is unchanged. So we'll say df dt equals negative cf plus d times r times f. What we've written down is exactly the set of equations that we would want to see if we're enforcing a carrying capacity for these rabbits. I'm going to make a little suggestion though about what to do with this one over k term. The way this equation is set up, k must be positive. We can't set it to zero because it lives down here in the denominator. What I suggest we do is take this one over k that we now have in this parentheses expression in the drdt line, and let's replace one over k with a new parameter n. And when we do that, what we're gonna see instead for our first equation for the rabbit population is a r times one minus n r minus b r f. What's the advantage here? Well, if k exists, so if we have a carrying capacity for our rabbits, n is just one over k. So we don't really have a change here, it's just we've rewritten it a little bit differently. But this also allows us to set n equal to zero, and that would return us our original equation. So when we switch back over to MATLAB and we rewrite the equation that we have down at that nested subfunction at the bottom, if we use n, then we can specify n at the top as zero if we wanna see the original model or a positive number if we wanna see this carrying capacity model. So instead of having like case by case different equations, we can roll everything into one equation. Let's see what effect enforcing this carrying capacity has on the compartmental model that we sketched before. So we still have two populations. Rabbits experience a growth modeled by the parameter a times r, they experience loss due to interactions between the rabbits and the foxes just like before, but I'm gonna scoot this up because there's a new factor which can decrease the rabbit population. Enforcing a carrying capacity is like saying that rabbits can suffer from too much interaction with each other because they're competing for resources. So here we will subtract off a n r squared Notice r squared is like r times r. That's like r times f, but here we're looking at rabbits competing with each other in an ecosystem which has limited resources. If they're below the carrying capacity, that term isn't going to drive their population downwards. They're still going to grow, but they're not gonna grow at an exponential rate. If they're above the carrying capacity, then this r squared term is gonna to be too large and it will cause their population to decrease. So that's our new compartmental viewpoint. Now let's go back to the equations and we'll look for equilibrium solutions.
Before we pass into MATLAB, let's do some work on paper. So let's find the equilibrium solutions. The first step is the same as before. For the right-hand side of the first equation, we'll factor r in front. That leaves us with r times a. Let me distribute it. So how about a minus a in r minus bf. And then for the second equation, we'll factor f in front. That leaves us with f times the quantity negative c plus dr. The second line is easier to work with. There are two possibilities there. Either f equals 0 or r is c over d. Those could actually both be true. So you could have both f equals 0 and r equals c over d. So we'll consider that too. But let's take those two hypotheses from the second equation now and use them to evaluate the first equation. I just realized I should probably mention that what we're doing, of course, is zeroing out the left-hand side. So we want our derivatives to be zero when we have our equilibrium solutions. Okay, looking at the right-hand side of the first equation, let's see what happens when we plug f equals zero into it. The bf term is going to vanish. I could actually factor the a in front as well. So we'll have 0 equals a times r times 1 minus n times r. So that tells us either r equals 0 or r equals 1 over n, which is actually k, the carrying capacity. Okay, so let me actually write the equilibrium solutions down at the bottom. So as we find them, I'll fill this out. So equilibrium solutions. We have the trivial one, no rabbits, no foxes. We found a new one that we didn't have before. No foxes, but rabbits at their carrying capacity if it exists. What I mean by that is if we were looking at the first version, we would have set n equal to 0 when we wouldn't have this equilibrium solution. Hey, we're done with the possibility that there are no foxes, so let's plug r equals c over d into the first equation. We get 0 equals c over d times the quantity a minus a times n times c over d minus bf. c and d are both positive, so I can go ahead and divide out that first expression. So then let's see, I'm going to work over to the right. We want to take this expression in parentheses and set it equal to 0, solve for f. We would first have bf equals a minus a n c over d. I'm going to divide by b now and maybe write my terms a little bit more cleanly. So if we do that, we'll have f equals a over b minus a c divided by b d times n. And that's the only possibility for the foxes when the rabbit population is c over d. OK, so our final equilibrium solution can be expressed as rabbits and foxes equals rabbit population is c over d, and the fox population is a over b minus ac over bd times n. I'm going to leave this as n rather than replace it with 1 over k because something kind of neat happens here. If k doesn't exist, so if we're not imposing a carrying capacity on the rabbit population, then we would take n and we would set it to 0, kind of like turning off that possibility. In which case, this third equilibrium solution I've written down actually reduces to our original equilibrium solution rabbits is c over d, foxes is a over b. So this n term there kind of encompasses the first scenario that we've already looked at. OK, so we have three expressions here for our equilibrium solutions. Whether or not we're always going to have three kind of depends on this carrying capacity term we've seen. We're going to be a little bit more organized here in this MATLAB demonstration we're about to do. So we'll investigate a few different possibilities for this carrying capacity and see what happens over time to these populations. So what we're really interested in is what are the long-term behaviors for the fox and rabbit populations?
Here's where we left the predator prey code that we were working on before. What we need to do now is add in this carrying capacity parameter in. We'll adjust the code, including the ODE45 code and the nested subfunction at the bottom to incorporate in. And then we're just gonna look at some plots and see how affecting in affects the long-term behavior of the fox and rabbit population. The first thing I'm gonna do is on line one, I'm gonna switch close to close all. I realized I should have done that last time. What close was doing was closing the most recent window and close all will close both of them. In this code, we're generating two plots. So each time I would like to completely wipe those away and start afresh. Okay, then let's come down here. We have our parameters A, B, C, D. We still have those, but now we're gonna have N. And what I'm gonna do is start with N equals one divided by 3000. I'll type it in like that. That way, when you look at it, you can read off that the carrying capacity we're assuming for rabbits in this simulation is going to be 3000. So let me say N equals one over K, where K is the carrying capacity. And then I'll just put N equals zero turns this off. Okay. Next thing we need to do is in the ODE45 command, I'm going to have a new parameter called n. So I'm going to add that to the end of the list of parameters here. Then let's see, all of this is going to be the same. The first plot will be the same. For the second plot, our equilibrium solution is going to be different. It's going to be a b minus a times c divided by b times b times n, watch your parentheses there, got to do order of operations. So that's going to be our new equilibrium solution in that plot. Then down here, I need to change my inputs for this nested subfunction to match what they are up here. So we're going to feed in into this. And then let's see, we have AP. This is the DRDT equation. This is the one that changed. So let me do times, and I'll do a ray multiplication, one minus n times p1 because that represents the rabbits. Okay, save everything. I think this looks good. Let me go ahead and run this. All right, if you take a look, this is the second plot. Let me add some axis labels here just so we know what we're looking at. So how about x label is rabbits, y label is boxes. Okay, now you can see the close all command is working as it should. And what we have here is we started with, um, what was our initial populations? Oh, <laughs> initially I said there were two rabbits and 10 foxes. So that starts all the way down here. And then if we follow this curve along, we're rotating counterclockwise just like we were before. But this time, instead of having a closed orbit, we're spiraling in closer and closer and closer to the equilibrium solution. So we have a fundamentally different picture than we did the first time when we did not have the carrying capacity. These initial conditions are a little bit extreme. Let me just change that to 100 rabbits and 60 foxes. So that's gonna be initial condition up here. While the plot is a little bit different, you can see that qualitatively it's the same thing. We're spiraling in closer and closer to that equilibrium solution. I'm gonna make that equilibrium solution a little bit smaller. Let's make it point size 10. Okay, so you can see the long-term behavior. Let's look at the first plot. This is plotting both of the populations over time. So rabbits and foxes. And you can see that we get the up and down behavior like before, but this time the oscillations are decreasing in amplitude each time. And what we're observing is that the long-term trend for both of these populations is towards their equilibrium values. So by introducing this carrying capacity in for the rabbits and redoing that DRDT equation, we're getting a stabilizing effect on the populations. So we're predicting that over time, yes, they're gonna go up and down, kind of out of sync like they did before, but they're trending somewhere. Notice that the rabbit population is not trending towards the carrying capacity because that was set up as if there were no foxes. Instead, it should be trending towards C over D. Let's check that in the command window. Yep, that's 400. So C over D is the equilibrium value for rabbits. And then A over B minus A times C 
divided by B times D times N, that's the equilibrium value for boxes. So that seems to be about here. Okay, let's change the carrying capacity and see what effect, if any, that has on our plots. To do that, all I have to do is come to line seven now and change this ratio. So instead of N equals one over 3000, let's just make it 2000. So we're lowering the carrying capacity for the rabbits in the absence of foxes. I'm gonna run this. And it doesn't seem that different. If you were to compare this graph to the first one, let me just do that really quickly. You might notice slightly less rotations. So here's 3000 and then here is 2000. Seems like it doesn't revolve around quite as much before it gets really close to the equilibrium solution. Let's look at the first plot. Qualitatively very similar, oscillations towards the equilibrium values. But again, you might see less up and down behavior compared to before. Let's make the carrying capacity even lower. So let's set it to 1000. Now we see even less rotation. So we're barely circling around before really getting towards that equilibrium value. And then also I want you to notice that the value of the foxes in particular is lower. In fact, the rabbits are unaffected. They're still at 400, but the population for equilibrium for the foxes has gone down. So here it's 30. If I go back to 3000, it was about 43. So we're saying that this environment with a larger carrying capacity could also sustain a larger number of foxes. And that should make sense because if there's more food, because the rabbits can thrive a little bit more in this particular ecosystem, then the foxes can also thrive more. Whereas if we say, let's go to a new environment where we can't support as many rabbits, we also can't support as many foxes. So the fox population attains equilibrium at a lower level. First plot, you're just gonna see a couple big swings before we really flatten out at the steady state solution. Let's cut this in half and say we can only support really 500 rabbits. Here you can see we don't even really do a full rotation. For this ecosystem, it looks to me like we're starting with a high number of foxes. The rabbits almost die off in the picture. Then they recover towards equilibrium. They're still stabilizing at 400, but now we can only support about 10 foxes. Okay, something special is gonna happen if I put in 400 rather than 500. Actually, first, before we do that, let's just look at the first plot. You don't really see any swings. They just basically go right towards equilibrium. Okay, now let's switch this to 400. You'll see something different. Okay, if you look at this equilibrium value, it's actually zero for the foxes. We don't actually get to that equilibrium solution in this picture, we're approaching it asymptotically, but what this picture is showing is that these foxes are gonna go extinct. If we look at figure one, the rabbits again are trending towards 400. Notice here, 400 is the equilibrium value for the rabbits and it's also the carrying capacity, so maybe there's something to be said there. The foxes, on the other hand, they're going extinct. Okay, what happens if I lower this even more? Say this environment can only sustain 300 rabbits. Here, this equilibrium solution is now negative, so it's not a practical one for this model because we don't have a negative number of foxes. So if we look at this population, the foxes really go extinct. Actually, let me go back to figure two and point something out. You might be wondering why this slam dunk breaks here instead of going all the way down to the equilibrium value, which is now negative that we approached before. And that's because this solution curve is actually now approaching a different equilibrium value. It's one of the other three. So we have one equilibrium solution at the origin, but that's not really relevant here because we have rabbits and foxes. So we're not in that zero zero situation. However, we do have another equilibrium solution when we have a carrying capacity and that was actually rabbits at the carrying capacity. So I'll do one over N, careful if N is zero, that will mess up. Foxes are zero. 
So now you can see that the solution is approaching that other equilibrium value where there are no foxes and the rabbits are at their carrying capacity. So numerically, we've observed that for a high carrying capacity, both populations thrive and in fact stabilize over time. If we start to lower the carrying capacity, for a while they'll both be sustained, but if there are fewer rabbits, then there are also going to be fewer foxes. Eventually we get to the point where while the rabbits thrive, they're just not enough to support a fox population because the carrying capacity of rabbits is just too low to provide enough food for a fox population, and so the foxes go extinct. This is what we've observed numerically. Let's now go back to pencil and paper and see if we can justify this analytically. All right, let's see if we can work out analytically some of that behavior that we were just observing in MATLAB. So let's analyze this model. And in particular, we're going to think about what adjusting that parameter in that we've introduced does. So I've copied over here the equilibrium solutions that we've already found. We know we have the one that says that if you never have any rabbits or foxes, you expect that to continue. Then we have two others. If there's a carrying capacity, it's possible that you have no foxes and rabbits just exist at their carrying capacity. Another way of seeing that is if you have no foxes and you have any number of rabbits, over time you would expect them to trend to that carrying capacity. They would just follow logistic growth. And then if we do have both foxes and rabbits, there's an interesting equilibrium that we've observed when rabbits are C over D and foxes are A over B minus AC over BD times N. So what kind of message should we have about N? But what we discovered is that if N is small, as long as that value for the foxes was positive, over time we expected to trend to it with the fox population. But what we saw was that as the carrying capacity K goes down, in other words, as N goes up, what will happen is that fox value for that second equilibrium will shrink towards zero until eventually it is zero. So let's make precise what we would observe when that is zero. So consider the third equilibrium. Then the equilibrium value for foxes is zero when A over B minus AC over BD times N equals zero. Let's see, we can multiply through by B. That gets rid of those denominators. We can also divide out by A. So now that leading fraction of A over B has been reduced to one. So ultimately the solution here is N equals D over C, which is equivalent to K equals C over D. That tells us that the third equilibrium solution is actually K comma zero. It's the same as the second. Okay, so let's summarize the critical values for N. When N equals zero, there's no carrying capacity and we have two equilibrium solutions. When n is between 0 and d over c, we have three distinct equilibria. At the moment when n equals d over c, then the second and third equilibrium solutions collide on the rabbit axis and we're back to 2. Lastly, if n is greater than d over c, we would only have two equilibrium that have non-negative populations. There are three mathematically, but the third one has the fox population as a negative quantity, so we're only going to have two that we would reasonably observe. Hey, you can see there are bifurcation values for n. As we transition from n equals zero to n greater than zero, we have a qualitative change in the behavior of our system. And then similarly, as we go from n smaller than d over c to n equal to d over c, and then n greater than d over c, we have another qualitative change in our behavior. So let's also describe what the long-term predictions for the rabbits and foxes are for each of these scenarios, and we'll assume that we have positive starting populations for each, because it wouldn't be very interesting to imagine that we don't have any foxes, for example. Okay, so we're gonna have four descriptions. What happens when n equals zero? In this scenario, we don't have a carrying capacity. 
Now, what we observed in our first MATLAB simulation is that the rabbits and foxes forever oscillate at the same amplitude from higher than the equilibrium to lower than the equilibrium. They don't converge to anything. What happens now if we have a carrying capacity which is quite large? Say k is greater than c over d, so that n is, is a positive number less than d over c. In this situation, what we saw is that the rabbits and foxes oscillate, but they both limit towards their equilibrium point. Rabbits tend to c over d, foxes tend to a over b minus a c over b d times n. If n is at the value d over c, then rabbits converge to the carrying capacity and the foxes die off. This convergence happens slowly. What I mean by slowly is if you look at the other case, n greater than d over c, the convergence happens more quickly. So here we have the same result. Rabbits converge to c over d, foxes go extinct, and they would go extinct a little faster. The message here is that in order for the fox population to survive, if there's a carrying capacity on the rabbits, we need the parameter n to be between 0 and d over c. Translating that back into concepts, that means that the carrying capacity is larger than c over d. We need a carrying capacity which is, is big. We don't want a small carrying capacity for the rabbits. Let's use that idea that in order for a large predator to survive, the carrying capacity for the food needs to be large in order to suggest a theory explaining why there are no large mammal predators in Australia. So if you look at all the different continents, you have large predators on most of them. In Australia, they don't have large predators. I think the largest one is a dingo, but I'm not totally sure about that. There are different theories why, for example, one suggestion is just that humans hunted them to extinction. So it could be that. But we could actually come up with a reason based on the model that we've been looking at. So let's take our rabbit and foxes model, and instead of thinking of it in terms of rabbits and foxes, I'm going to let R represent small animals that graze, so small grazers. So these are animals that eat vegetables, and they provide the food for F. Let F represent the large carnivores. Now I've copied over the equations we've been working with. I want to focus on two values here, n and d. C is just the parameter that says that they die off in the absence of food. So we'll just imagine C is, say, constant across all continents. D tells us how nourishing the food is. So if you think about a large carnivore consuming small animals, D is a pretty small number because a large carnivore needs to eat a lot. So a large carnivore should have multiple interactions with the animals. It's not like a snake that I think eats a mouse once a month or something like that. We're talking about animals that need to feed on a more regular basis. So since D represents how beneficial each interaction is, whenever F represents a large animal, D has to be small. So if we're talking about large carnivores, we'll imagine that D is small. Now let's think about the grazing animals. They're eating the vegetables in the environment. And if you think about Australia, it's not a very nutrient rich continent compared to some of the others, right? So we imagine the bush and, and vegetation being a bit more sparse. So that means that the carrying capacity for the small animals is lower relative to how it might be on other continents. Since n is 1 over k, that means that n is large. In order for the large carnivores to thrive, we need n to be less than d over c. But now what we're saying is that the quantity on the left, n, is a large number, whereas the numerator on the right, d, is small. So just based on this little analysis, it seems unlikely that this inequality will be satisfied. So that would put us in the parameter regime n greater than or equal to d over c, and in that case we would expect the large carnivores to die off. Okay, the predator-prey equations are one of my favorite models in mathematics. I hope you enjoyed looking at them with me. Thank you for your attention.